there's a great big elephant in the room called the economy. So let's start talking about that. I wanted to give you a current picture of the economy. That's what I have behind myself. <laughs> but of course, what we have to remember is this. And what we have to think about is when you're dancing in the flames, what's next? So what I'm going to try and do in the next 17 and a half minutes is I'm going to talk first about the flames, where we are in the economy, and then I'm going to take three trends that have taken place at TED over the last 25 years and that will take place in this conference, and I will try and bring them together. And I will try and give you a sense of what the ultimate reboot looks like. Those three trends are the ability to engineer cells, the ability to engineer tissues, and robots. And somehow it will all make sense. But anyway, let's start with the economy. There's a couple of really big problems that are still sitting there. One is leverage. And the problem with leverage is it makes the US financial system look like this. <laughs> so a normal commercial bank has nine to 10 times leverage. That means for every dollar you deposit, it loans out about nine or 10. A normal investment bank is not a deposit bank, it's an investment bank, it has 15 to 20 times. It turns out that B of A in September had 32 times, and your friendly Citibank had 47 times. Oops. That means every bad loan goes bad 47 times over. And that, of course, is the reason why all of you are making such generous and wonderful donations to these nice folks. And as you think about that, you've got to wonder, so what do banks have in store for you now? <laughs> it ain't pretty. Well, the government, meanwhile, has been acting like Santa Claus. We all love Santa Claus, right? But the problem with Santa Claus is when you look at the mandatory spending of what these folks have been doing and promising folks, it turned out that in 1967, about 38% oh, was mandatory spending on what we call entitlements. And then by 2007, it was 68%. And we weren't supposed to run into 100% until about 2030, except we've been so busy giving away a trillion here, a trillion there, that we've brought that date of reckoning forward to about 2017. And we thought we were gonna be able to lay these debts off on our kids, but guess what? We're gonna to start to pay them. And the problem with this stuff is now that the bills come due, it turns out Santa isn't quite as cute when it's summertime, right? Here's some advice from one of the largest investors in the United States. This guy runs the China Investment Corporation. He is the main buyer of US Treasury bonds, and he gave an interview in December. Here's his first bit of advice, and here's his second bit of advice. And by the way, the Chinese Prime Minister reiterated this at Davos last Sunday. This stuff is getting serious enough that if we don't start paying attention to the deficit, we're going to end up losing the dollar. And then all bets are off. Let me show you what it looks like. I think I can safely say that I'm the only trillionaire in this room. This is an actual bill, and it's $10 trillion. And the only problem with this bill is it's not really worth very much. That was eight bucks last week, four bucks this week, a buck next week. And that's what happens to currencies when you don't stand behind them. So the next time that some, something as cute as this shows up on your doorstep, and sometimes this creature is called Chrysler, and sometimes Ford, and sometimes whatever you want, you've just got to say no. And you've got to start banishing a word that's called entitlement. And the reason we have to do that in the short term is because we have just run out of cash. If you look at the federal budget, this is what it looks like. The orange slice is what's discretionary. Everything else is mandated. It makes no difference if we cut out the bridges to Alaska in the overall scheme of things. 
So what we have to start thinking about doing is capping our medical spending, because that's a monster that's simply going to eat the entire budget. We've got to start thinking about asking people to retire a little bit later. If you're 60 to 65, you retire on time. Your 401k just got nailed. If you're 50 to 60, we want you to work two years, late, two years more. If you're under 50, we want you to work four more years. And the reason why that's reasonable is when your grandparents were given Social Security, they got it at 65 and they're expected to check out at 68. 68 is young today. We've also got to cut the military about 3% a year. We've got to limit other mandatory spending. We've got to quit borrowing as much because otherwise that interest is going to eat that whole pie. And we've got to end up with a smaller government. And if we don't start changing this trend line, we are going to lose the dollar and start to look like Iceland. Now, I got what you're thinking. This is going to happen when hell freezes over. But let me remind you, this December, it did snow in Vegas. <laughs> Here's what happens if you don't address this stuff. So Japan had a fiscal and real estate crisis back in the late 80s. And its 225 largest companies today are worth one quarter of what they were 18 years ago. We don't fix this now. How would you like to see a Dow 3500 in 2026? Because that's the consequence of not dealing with this stuff. And unless if you want this person to become the CFO, not just of Florida, but the United States, we better deal with this stuff. That's the short term. That's the flame part. That's the financial crisis. Now, right behind the financial crisis, there's a second and bigger wave that we need to talk about. That wave is much larger, much more powerful, and that's, of course, the wave of technology. And what's really important in this stuff is, as we cut, we also have to grow. Among other things, because venture-backed startup companies are 0.02% of US GDP investment, and they're about 17.8% of output. It's groups like that in this room that generate the future of the US economy, and that's what we've got to be growing. We don't have to keep growing these bridges to nowhere. So let's bring a romance novelist into this conversation. And that's where these three trends come together. That's where the ability to engineer microbes, the ability to engineer tissues, and the ability to engineer robots begin to lead to a reboot. And let me recap some of the stuff you've seen. Craig Venter showed up here last year and showed you the first fully programmable cell that acts like hardware, where you can insert DNA and have it boot up as a different species. In parallel, the folks at MIT have been building a standard registry of biological parts. So think of it as a radio shack for biology. You can go out and get your proteins or your RNA or your DNA or whatever and start building stuff. In 2006, they brought together high school students and college students and started to build these little odd creatures. They just happened to be alive instead of circuit boards. Here's one of the first things they built. <laughs> so cells have this cycle. First they don't grow, then they grow exponentially, and then they stop growing. Graduate students wanted to find a way of telling which stage they were in. So they engineered these cells so that when they're growing in the exponential phase, they would smell like wintergreen. And when they stopped growing, they would smell like bananas. And you could tell very easily when your experiment was working and wasn't where it was in the phase. This got a little bit more complicated two years later. 21 countries came together, dozens of teams. They started competing. The team from Rice University started to engineer the substance in red wine that makes red wine good for you into beer. <laughs> so you take resveterol and put it into beer. Of course, one of the judges is wandering by and he goes, wow, cancer fighting beer. There is a god. <laughs> the team from Taiwan was a little bit more ambitious. They tried to engineer bacteria in such a way that they would act as your kidneys. Four years ago, I showed you this picture. And people oohed and awed because Cliff Tabin had been able to grow an extra wing on a chicken. And that was very cool stuff back then. But now moving from bacterial engineering to tissue engineering, let me show you what's happened in that period of time. Two years ago, you saw this creature, an almost extinct animal from Xochimilco, Mexico, called an ajolote, that can regenerate its limbs. You can freeze half the heart, it regrows. You can freeze half the brain, it regrows. It's almost like